Hey everyone, welcome to our talk on metal influencing and ownership. Um, we're excited to be conversing today at the Gatherverse Music Meets Metaverse Summit. I'm Lachey Herring, the COO of Black Metaverse. Our community is totally built on ensuring that our culture is represented in Web3 spaces. Uh, my mission specifically and my passion is to increase the knowledge of Metaverse, Web3, and all emerging tech. Uh, to share the opportunities and help pave the way for collaboration across the BIPOC communities. And uh, Stefan? Yeah, thank you. <laughs> oh man, it's so great to be here, y'all. I'm Stefan Youngblood. I'm Raleigh, North Carolina. I always put this out there. I'm a dad of three and I'm, oh God, I got five grandkids. And this whole thing of tech is not new to me, but this part of combining tech, uh, Web3, this whole new uncharted area of um, where we can go in the future, virtual reality uh, I'm involved in, and I'm the CEO, as Lachey said, of uh, Black Metaverse. And we're just seeing a whole lot happen that artists are coming, uh, musicians, artists, uh, people that are discovering a new way to own their rights, own material, leverage it for revenue in the um, metaverse. And then, you know, we're actually involved even with education and healthcare as it sort of makes a uh, jump from just a web two based into more creative ways in the classrooms and companies and that type thing. So we'll be talking about some of the ideas this morning with uh, music and the arts and digital technology and that uh, in metaverse. Yes, Stefan, with that stated, um, today we're joined with two outstanding creators, Ron Lawrence and uh, Kwame, AKA Dark Miss, who have and continue to make waves in the space of music, art, film, and technology. I would love for the Gattaverse community and the world at large to gain some of the nuggets and wisdom that you all have um, you know, experienced. And so if you could just give a little, little bit of snippet about your uh, trajectory from the beginning to where you are now um, in your creative spaces. Well, my name is Ron Lawrence. I'm a record producer, Grammy. I'm a record producer, I produce for Notorious B.I.G., Jay-Z, uh, all the way up to Rita Franklin and Luther Bandra. So, you know, my, I, I stem from R&B to hardcore hip hop. I've done it all. I've been doing it for quite a while. I started off as a, as a rapper and a rap group called Two Kings and a Cypher. Started at Howard University and, um, you know, got into production eventually and, and became one of the, uh, the original bad boy hitman and went on to produce um you know slew hit records and uh eventually got into filmmaking i uh, went enrolled in new york film academy and learned how to edit shoot and produce movies so um you know that's been my life for the you know the past few few years of music and film and you know and i love it and um with this whole metaverse and cryptocurrency and that whole technology coming together with this, you know, this music and film and this whole creative space emerging, it's it's like a whole whole new world where this thing can go. And I'm right in the front seat, ready to experience the whole thing. <laughs> so I am darkness and I just named it as Kwame, and I have been in this uh, virtual space of art and creativity for quite some time, but more notably in the past year and a half, I came into the crypto art space in January, uh, just experimenting around hearing the wave about crypto artists and the uh, freedom and independence that started to give the artists these spaces. So I initially came in as a visual artist, um, actually making digital poems and physical poems. So that's how I started. And what I was doing was using the art to show and teach the story of my culture. So I would create these poems that would have some you know, African symbolism, but more precise Ghanaian symbolism, the country that I'm from, and just a unique type of, of ornament that I would create. However, once I started getting into the space more, I wanted to dabble more with the, you know, expand more on my creativity being digital sculpts and whatnot. So uh, I'd probably say it was about eight months being in the crypto space, uh, maybe had about um, 20 
designs or images that are created. And um, though it was a pretty slow start, eventually everything just started to take off with it. And the fast forward to around December, December, I was contacted by president of Time Magazine, Keith Grossman, to be part of the Time Pieces family. And what that meant was they have a collection of artists from the Web3 space that they invited into their brand, um, which they both support and bring us into different different activities where we can get a little bit more expansions in the art that we do, more exposure per se. Um, so getting at the beginning of this year, um, I released some art under the timepieces and it went, uh, went fairly well. And I think that's when everybody started to take notice <laughs> of me, I'd say. My first piece from timepieces being sold to XCO or T-Mobile, uh, John Revere, would have and this is this is where the music side came in so i've been doing all the visual arts up to this point but i was contacted by time to and encouraged to try my hand at the music competition and interestingly i was not going to do it you know i just only for the reason that i had not dabbled in music for some time and the timeline was just a little bit short so i only had a few hours to you know, get myself together if i was going to do it but I accepted the challenge and I went ahead and did it and actually ended up winning by this choice, which then um, lined me up with the beat club, beat club staff. And so up to, to this date, I'm definitely doing quite a bit, a lot between the timepieces as well as with the Reverend Lab uh, Mental Fight Club and now working very closely with uh, beat club as a music producer, but also as a visual artist, bringing together some of the concepts and ideas. And what, what put me in a very unique position, especially with Beat Club, was the fact that I do both visual and music. So Beat Club being a music production firm, they like the, they like the idea that I understood music as well as the visuals. And so we have some really, really cool stuff that we'll be working on and hopefully being releasing in the coming weeks. So I'm really excited to just be uh, soon showing everything I've been doing up to this time that will be released with the different groups I've been working with. That's cool. Man, appreciate that. Lachey, I was thinking, he reminded me when he was saying that, um, when we talk about how music is sort of merging um, with documentary films and both of them are involved in that, you know, maybe you wanted to sort of throw that question out there. Yeah, that's exactly where I was actually leading to. Um, you know, Ron just shared um, his, you know, amazing platform um, of a career and, and all those who he's been um, connected with. Um, and like Stefan is saying, there's definitely some synergy here. So Ron meet Kwame, Kwame meet Ron. <laughs> um, um, you know, Ron, as, as you've been a and you know, are a documentary film producer, you're an owner of a streaming video platform. Um, you know, you've talked about um, you know, the metaverse, uh, you know, we defined it just a, just a few minutes ago. But I'm just wanting to know, like, what bridge do you see um, merging uh, between um, music and film and the NFT and, and metaverse space? Um, well, what I see eventually will probably start happening is um, filmmakers probably won't have to, they won't have to go to two big movie houses to get financed. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Go to a bank to get a line of credit. Yeah. You know, all they have to do is put up an NFT, say, hey, <laughs> this is the trailer. That's it. Yeah. 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 Especially. Especially, let's say if you're Spike Lee. Spike Lee has a track record. Mm -hmm. So who wouldn't want to invest in one of his movies? You know, or Martin Scorsese, for that matter. He'll say, well, hey, you know, my next movie is going to be NFT driven. And and if this is the white paper, this is what this, doc, this movie is about. And I'm directing it. And uh, and I got Leonardo DiCaprio as leading that leading role. Mm -hmm. I'll be the first in line to to, 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 <laughs> right. to buy the you know invest in the NFT. Yeah, because I know it's, you know he's he's already good for box office success. Yeah, right. So um, I clearly see that 
if that happens and it goes in that direction, mm -hmm. then you're going to have a lot of independents mm. who are going to, you know, it, it's, it, it'll, it'll definitely put a lot of uh, pressure on a lot of these companies because then they, they'll, they'll realize mm. that right. we don't need them anymore. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Oh, sorry. So you're talking, it's just so, so many different ways that you can, you can take this, you know, and then you have, um, uh, well, outtakes of, 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 a, of a film that may not be shown or alternative endings that you can actually yeah. add to the NFT mm -hmm. and say, well, you know, if you, if you invest in this NFT, then you'll get the, if you don't like this ending, here's the alternative ending, right? Yeah. That's oh. great. And you own that. You, you could that. actually sell that. So somebody yeah. owns, yeah, the alternative. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And then you turn around and you can sell that to somebody else yeah. <laughs> for more money. <laughs> and so with that being stated, I mean, it, you're you're talking about film right now. Um, but that could, that same concept can be applied to music. Um, uh, Kwame, like your thoughts on that. Like what 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 is the bridging? um between music and nfts like what what are your thoughts on where is the space moving to yeah that's a great question because i got into the space when everything was strictly visual images there, there mm -hmm. wasn't film hadn't been introduced even photography hadn't been introduced so i had a chance to i've had a chance to watch all of this grow into different mediums coming in and I even remember thinking to myself a year ago that, oh, film, film is, is going to be big. It's going to make its time here, uh, and as well as music. And I'm seeing how that is slowly starting to grow in terms of um, the visual artistry and the, uh, the audible artistry. Now, when it comes together, there's one thing that we notice a lot of uh, films have in, in, in terms of what's been in soundtracks. And so we're gonna to get to a point where it's gonna be, you know, the filmmakers, the collaborations, this is how all these collaborations come in. So for example, a lot of musicians and what I'm experiencing from the NFT world, again, I came as a visual artist, but I have a lot of musicians that reach out to me and say, hey, well, I have this music. I would love to put a visual. So now, with film coming into it, it's gonna do another spin where it's, hey, well, you do all these music and soundtracks. I need some audio for my film. Mm -hmm. um, this is now where you can get musicians to, that might have created sound samples, sound bites, sound clips, and you can allow artists or, or visionaries, filmmakers to be able to grab some of these sound bites for their films or have these collaborations. You know, imagine if you have a film, we, we sometimes have films where there is no spoken word in it, but it's just audio and you want to convey a mood. And that's where all this business is coming. So imagine in just a short amount of time, you're going to have uh, a, a collective collaborative group of people that might come together and say, I want to do film that has live action, but I need this artist that does visual effects, and I need this artist that does music. Mm -hmm. And now everybody is coming in together and putting that. And I'm I am very excited to see how this all comes together. So um, it's going to be a, definitely a big fusion. It's going to end up being something that has kind of emulated and copied real life, but instead in the blockchain now the artists have direct power. Don't have to go reach out and look for huge budgets. You're just looking for artists that are vibing and do what you do and can come together collectively to put this together in the NFT space. Yeah. And I'm very sure that well, it's all going to fuse together soon. Yeah, that's good. Um, let's say I was just going to throw out a question there um, because so we have this ecosystem is Black Metaverse is just exploded into uh, a sort of this cohesion of people who are working in this space. And we, there are musicians and artists and directors. There's people doing films and document uh, poets. Um, it seems like the area for black film producers, artists, artists, 
um, musicians in the black community to find a whole new space of ownership. So we look at places like Motown, we think well, that's us. We know that that whole thing right there. We look at New Orleans and jazz and a whole lot of places that we know, well, that's us. I'm, I'm interested in Ron, what, what do you think about where the black community and our ownership or where this could take some of us as a community, um, what are the possibilities that are there for the, for, you know, black artists in the metaverse? Um, well, first of all, you can, for black artists being independent mm. and being able to, to sell your album yeah. without having to be a part of a, a record company, because what the record companies are going to do with these black artists, especially if they're, you know, the ones that that's already signed, they're going to take their NFT rights away, which means wow. mm -hmm. they will control it, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's important that when these black artists, when they reach to the point where they don't need the labels anymore, mm -hmm. like for instance, like, uh, like let's say Drake fulfills his mm -hmm. tenure album deals or whatever. Right, right. He says, you know what? I don't want to resign with the label anymore. I'm just going to go straight NFTs. Mm -hmm. you know? He's going to make a whole way, probably way more money than he would make now yeah. I'm not even gonna say probably he will yeah. make it well, yeah. Yeah. Will make, yeah because the the thing about most NFTs a lot of it is just it's just based on hype and there's really nothing to back them up it's just an NFT you know and it's like you know what gives it value but the mm -hmm. fact like an artist like Drake already has value because he has a proven track record of selling so many records mm -hmm. and he decides to put his album out as an NFT he says oh you know what. I will fractionalize my album. I'm going to sell, you know, a thousand shares for X amount of dollars. And the first thousand shares that gets it, you know, that's it, right? Mm -hmm. And then, and it can equal amount to how many ever shares that he sells. And it could be just 50% of his album he's just giving away, right? And then he sells like a million, let's say he sells a million pieces for like a dollar. He, and he, he could probably make like a, a million dollars in, in a couple of hours or within minutes when people yeah. find out he's dropping an album, right? So, and then they turn around, hey, I'm the only one, I'm, I'm one of the million that, that has a, a percentage of Drake's album. I, yeah. I can turn around and sell for $500 now, yeah. Yeah. right? Now Drake gets 50% of that and his money keeps quadrupling mm -hmm. every time somebody sells a percentage of that album, mm -hmm. right? So he's just, you know, he's, it's, it just continuously keeps going. So, I mean, I, it's just the opportunities is so it's, it's endless when it comes to that. Um, and I think that's what's, that's what's going to happen. And the record companies will be in trouble once they, they figure out what's going on, but they're going to try to get ahead of it because they're going to try to control the mm. with this 360 situation that they have. And they say, well, we're going to take, we're going to control this NST thing and we'll give you a, a percentage of it, you know? So mm -hmm. that's what's going to happen because they're going to clearly see, you know, just like how they do everything else with the shows and with the, um, with the, with the, um, the paraphernalia and everything, they take a percentage of that with the, with, with the 360 situation. So they're going to definitely try to put the entity into that. Mm -hmm. But I say to the independent black artists, sky's the limit. I mean, it, they have to take advantage of that. Yeah, yeah so for sure. I mean, it definitely opens the way for um, the true essence of a creator economy, right? I mean, the artist is going to bring their value. The NFT is going to bring the accessibility, right, to the artists, to the products um, that they that they actually put out, whether it's the music or whether it's what you actually just mentioned, Ron, just a second ago about um, the the product. I mean, we all know. Kanye is moving up because of the products, right? I mean, you got a hundred and fifty dollar t shirt, <laughs> people are buying it, right? And yeah. so, you know, we're if there, if he if he decides to put out an NFT, um, you know, that allows accessibility for them to go 
to the events, to the to the products, you know, what whatever the linkages to that specific artist. So yeah, I mean, you know, the web three tools that are that are that are that are currently out there, how things are currently evolving. We're talking about NFTs right now as a specific um, you know, tool, it's definitely opening up the future for the creator economy. Um, you know, one thing that Stefan and I were talking about, it was okay, well, what does this do to piracy? Like, does this decrease that possibility? Yeah. You know, you know thoughts on that? Um, um, well, as far as, uh, yeah, you know, the blockchain is concerned, you're supposed to be able to tra track all of that, you know? Mm -hmm. So it'll be interesting to see if that can actually get cracked. And now they're talking about the quantum computers and stuff like that, that should, that able to, they said it's able to crack the blockchain within minutes, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, so when you. Do you think the fear decreases? I mean, Kwame, I would love for you to well, jump well, in. Wow. Yeah, it, it's like, you know, you, you're taking, the scary part of it is you're taking people's material and you put it on a blockchain and it's not yours, right? And then, what happens if you get caught? Like, how do you, that's a big question. Like, how do you, how can you take somebody to, to, to court to say that that person- I got you. Who is, who is gonna enforce it if you took it out of that exactly. system of enforcement? Okay, I got you. Right. Mm -hmm. so, so, um, yeah. Yeah. so, yeah, this, this is a really cool uh, part of the topic as I've been, um, really deep diving into it, but we have music artists. So when I see, you know, we even have Nas. Nas did a release um, just several months ago on the blockchain and it, uh, he sold out. I, I actually tried to get a piece of it and I could not, 45 seconds, it was over. And this, his particular entity, he provided the royalties as part of his smart contract. You, you bought this NFT when his music was released now mm. you get a percentage of the royalties that come. Wow. Now you've mm -hmm. invested in him as that. You have Tory Lanez, who got released from his label um, not too long ago, and he drops a song. He makes over a million dollars in just that sale. Then he had, you know, it took him, you, it, it takes you millions of streams to get a few thousand dollars to pay out. But he did this NFT, and he gets all his money and his royalties all to himself. With the blockchain. Uh, now I was mentioning how I'm working with a B Club now, and this is this is interesting because I'm seeing how this is unraveling. And the exciting part about it, like we're saying, in blockchain, you can track back. So let's say me as a music producer, a lot of music producers or a lot of music artists come in, um, and because of the record label having this control, they don't see a lot of their money, right? Mm -hmm. Now, myself can come in as a music producer, say, I, I want to rock with you guys as a team. And where, where B Club is getting themselves in this unique position is they're saying, okay, well, we're not going to try and take the power, the, the power from the artist because we were once, a, once upon a time we were there. We're, we know how to do the business where we can get our cut, but now I'm part of the artist. So myself as a beat maker can team up with a group like that, make my beat, put it on the blockchain, music artists come in and if they want this music because this music has been an NFT, they can come in and, and get it. So we have the question of, you know, what if somebody steals you know, your tracks or whatnot, but it's in the blockchain. So six months down the line, you hear a song come on and you're like, wait a minute, I didn't get paid for that. I, that's my song. You want to go ahead and prove it, get into the blockchain, go back there, see in August 12th, Darkness released this track. <laughs> And there you go. So it's a really interesting place and it does give some empowerment. I think there's gonna be some things to iron out in it, but it's, I'm definitely seeing how this has empowered artists. I think many of many of us in the black metaverse know of this musician, Latasha in the space. And he was pretty much, she's, she's dominating it. She's dominating it and setting the standard and paving the ways for other musicians to come in and see how this works. So I think it's, really gonna get all these artists to a point that uh, it's gonna raise the confidence level. It's gonna give more independence. It's gonna give you a chance to be your own brand and market. And so now I see music producers, uh, lyricists, 
visual artists that are creating their brand. And so as, let's say in the next few months, everyone says darkness, visual, audio music, you'll know, go to his blockchain, see all the work that he's done. I, I can use the blockchain as my portfolio now. If I don't have a website, go on my blockchain, check my portfolio, and you can see everything I've done in the blockchain for the past year and a half. And that's, you know, and I think that even helps out more than trying to secure, create a website and improve what you've done. But you can go on my black blockchain, see my accolades, and then we talk smart contracts from there and to, to succeed all together. Yeah. Here's yeah. a scary situation, right? Uh-huh. There's this guy on the internet who goes on Wikipedia and he puts down records that he's written and produced. And he's even taking some of my credits. Hmm. So I'd have to go in there and get somebody to change it because it's not right. It's not real. You didn't produce this record. Why do you have, why are you taking my credit? Right. Mm -hmm. So I have someone who understands Wikipedia and tell them that that needs to be changed because it's not true, right? So it was changed. And then he went back a couple months later and changed it back. I caught it, had my people go back and change it. I think about the blockchain, somebody does that. That's it. Can, can't remove it. That's mm -hmm. the scary part. Yeah. Yeah, Ron, I see exactly what you're saying. And let's say, I'm really glad this came up because people who are on the edge and thinking about getting into metaverse, blockchain, things that are tied together like this in Web3, I get the ownership part and we all do. And we talk about being more decentralized, but then all of a sudden with this in infraction, Ron is saying, oh, I got somebody who needs to take care of this and I can get it changed. There's the enforcement of the infraction. So somebody puts his great work of art out there um, and then somebody does something that is an infraction of the law, even you, that's not yours. Who enforces something that where the system's being taken out of this system in a way that's a little bit extended from, you know, uh, a governance body that is actually going to, I guess, Ron, your thing would be to sue, right? Uh, eventually, you know, yeah, even, if you, you even, do. If, even if you sue, the damage is done. You still can't remove it. Right. Well, you know, so the blockchain, that's it, right? Well, um, yes I mean, and no, but what I've seen is because the blockchain has now become such a strong community driven, I've seen these cases um, mostly in the visual arts. It is happening all the time. People are trying to go in, they, they steal people's art, they try and put it on their blockchain credit. So this is what I've been seeing happen because of how tied is, is become community driven. Mm -hmm. There will be artists that will literally, and I've seen this in Twitter, they'll post and say, hey, such and such took my art and they post it, that's mine. And you will see a big, huge community of people come and just rally in there. And they, that's right, because, community enforcement. Yeah, mm -hmm. because of social, mm -hmm. yeah, because of the social power and economy, all time, some people just tweeting, this guy's a fraud fraud. Now this person that stole it risks getting their reputation torn down because this person that has it on blockchain can say, oh, look, check this date. Look at this. Now this person has minted this at this date. This is who mine. So, you know, but again, like Ron, what if you didn't put it on the blockchain first and someone did, and then you came behind and you did that? Yeah. And now it's like, okay, by the governance, and then you need the extra people that are from the outside of like. I know now, Ron, that's here's the thing. Go here's, ahead. here's the thing. There's the centralized and the decentralized part. Mm -hmm. The centralized part is is a uh, open sea. So someone will take your pick, and, and the decentralized part is the blockchain. So someone may take your, your, your artwork, put it on there before you, and try to claim credit for it. You can then go to OpenSea, show them your credentials, OpenSea takes it off, right? Because they, they're the centralized part. But on the, the blockchain part, on the smart contracts, that's the part that you can't remove, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Well, so, um, and yeah, that's a very interesting part about the, the smart contract. And I think maybe that's that that that's a, definitely something to consider because if somebody has that knowledge, let's say 
you know, Ron and I have been working together, but I have all this impressive knowledge of blockchain or, or a smart contract. <laughs> he shares some tracks. I go in there and do this thing. That could be a problem. So I think in this point, it's we're now relying on this family of community that could come quick back up where we say, ah, yeah. Black NFT, African NFT, Black Metaverse, I did this, help me, get them. And then, <laughs> you, and then it becomes like a whole group of warriors coming to get in. So now, but the question is, how, well, I would, I would suppose if you're able to rally behind and get this person to do that, I mean, it could be as simple as getting, not as simple, but they have to burn this NFT and burn this smart contract. But I suppose, yeah, you're still going through these hoops. And so now, how do we start to tackle that issue that's most likely going to happen in the future here? Yeah. 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 This, is, this is really interesting. I know we're at, at this point, we're kind of maybe talking about some obstacles for, you know, barriers to entry, right, into this space of linkaging of uh, your, your creative elements, uh, you know, against, you know, NFTs and, you know, um, you know and creating actually smart contracts. Do you think these are like the biggest hurdles for, you know, Black and BIPOC artists to be entering um, and trying to bridge their way into these spaces? Um, is the potentiality of, you know, having their creative elements really taken? Or are there, are there other obstacles that, that are kind of hindering artists from jumping into this space? It's interesting you say that because, I mean, a lot of, a lot of stuff that we've done, you know, in the past, uh, you know, bigger names from, from from other cultures and other races have capitalized on it and made it their own. You know, yeah. give me give me an example right there. I know what you're talking about, but explain that. Well, I mean, you know, rock and roll for once. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> right. But um, you know, um, there's so many other things that you know that you just don't know. Yeah, uh, I, because you know, we we blacks. We, we are very creative when it comes to uh, when it comes to, to music yeah just culture in general mm -hmm. and I see a lot of things that you know that that we put out there and it gets, it gets capitalized by other people and um, yeah. you know I think the, a big part of the, I just think the big part of the hurdle of it is is, is the, who we are and being able to keep up with the technology in it. Like we might have these issues, you know, where it might come to getting some of our work taken, but I think the bigger part of it is being taken advantage of because let's we have a you know a community, a black community of artists that are trying to get in the space. But imagine that if net if they don't come in and they don't meet the right people in the space to be protected you will have all of the, the others that come in and just kind of rob you of your credits. And so it's getting more and more important that us as in the Black community that have this knowledge continue to go ahead and educate because that's going to, that's our, probably our, the, one of, one of our biggest challenges and hurdles here is not getting the communication and information so now we're at this point, like we don't want to be left behind. When we started African NFT community, we said, okay, a lot of great artists, you know, um, but we needed to start educating so they can be in the picture or else what was going to happen is you would have just in like in real life, you would have others come in and say, oh, these are great artists. Let me just get all your art. But if you're coming from a third world country and you don't have too much knowledge of all these opportunities. Someone just say, hey, let me just buy it for $50. Now they've gone on the blockchain and they're just making lots of lots of money over. So I think one of the major hurdles would be the education and technology and getting it to our community and making sure the community understands everything about security, the blockchain, the currency, and, and how to move around this so that we can protect ourselves. So things like the credits on <laughs> Um, who who developed the stoplight or the CCTV? We know that comes from our people. Right, right? Mm -hmm. we're not being you know shown right. that. So, so I guess the interesting thing about the blockchain is that everything is recorded. Mm -hmm. So let's say from, from start to finish, you know, you write a script or you write these lyrics, record it on the blockchain. Mm -hmm. the next step, record it on the blockchain, and then you you know you give it to whoever, maybe the executive producer or whoever, 
but all that stuff gets recorded, you know? I was looking, I was checking out this guy, I forgot his name, he wrote Cooley High. Um, and he wrote uh, some of the early um, scripts for uh, like um, the Jeffersons. And uh -huh. I think if the blockchain wasn't placed for him, then he wouldn't have had that problem where he would have to fight for what he did, you know? Because yeah. his problem now is if he feels that, um, What's the, I, I, I just don't remember their names. Mm -hmm. But the, the big executive producer who produced a lot of those movies took a lot of his credits. And he, uh, yeah, interesting. You know, the same happened with that young lady from um, The Matrix. You guys know her, um, the mother of Matrix and Terminator. They ended up taking some of the, her credit. Yeah, she was, she, this black woman was be actually behind the Terminator, uh, the creation of the Terminator and Matrix. And she actually had to fight the big studios because of that. If she, had she been in the blockchain, she wouldn't have had that problem. I, I wish I could remember her name, uh, yeah. off the top, but all you have to do is just look mother of um, mother of mother matrix. matrix. And that, mm -hmm. I was gonna say last night we had you know 550 people in a room in social media uh, in Clubhouse talking about. Uh, ownership and us really knowing our rights when it comes to uh, our name, intellectual property. And uh, Barrington, I think is his name, comes in the room. He wrote Barbershop, the writer of Barbershop that we all know came in the room and was telling us some about. It, it used to be called Perfect Cut when he first did it. But it's the same story there. You know, there's, there's some stuff added to it where had there been something like blockchain that would have made it immutable just put it out there um it would have changed some things and i'm i hear what both of y'all saying especially ron you just mentioned our culture and how things have been taken from us and this is big this is part of the reason we have education in black metaverse because we want to see people protected i told people last night if you have an idea you got a, a poem a title or something you can mint that thing so fast in just a form on the blockchain and have it done. So that idea is done. So now let me get back over here to the trademark and all of that. So this type of education in letting people know, get some stuff minted out there, just get it. It solidifies it under your name and your intellectual property is huge. And when it comes to music, um, uh, Dark Miss, you said some stuff about beats. And Ron, you know, everybody in the business, you know, that's, um, looking to, as you said, if Drake starts to get some stuff out there or Kanye, it just changes the game because everyone understands and gets on board it more into the possibilities of, man, you protect it forever and now look at the possibilities with it. Yes, I agree. Yeah, it's so like I mean, new so age copywriting. Say it again. It's like new age copywriting. It is. And I'm going to tell you, every copyright attorney would say still do the copywriting. So but yes, that's exactly what it is. Uh, yeah, keep going. I'm sorry, Lachey, you were gonna say something? No, that's all good. No, no. Um, so that was kind of an added on piece to what we just, what you were just talking about. But what you guys are talking about is right now is the credit for the work and, and just wondering, you know, the fiduciary part of that, right? Like what percentages of musicians and artists, even if they are tied to, um, you know, tying their, their artistry to the blockchain and to NFTs, what percentage of them are actually making money, right? So, so kind of moving from the credit to actually, yeah. you know, coming away with some dollars, mm -hmm. you know, what percentage do you think are actually making money in this space right now? Mm -hmm. You know, in terms of what you, is the question, um, what percentage do we think in this blockchain space are black artists actually succeeding? Is that the question? That, that is a question and, and you it's, decided to, to actually uh, um, acquiring funding to go along with it and not just saying I think. Like, to me, and this is just from, from, from my little bubble, to me is a very slow percentage. I mean, a very low percentage, unfortunately, mm -hmm. because, you know, for example, in the African NFT community, you have 20,000 members, but of those 20,000 members, you probably only know five names or, you know, that people say, oh, I've heard that name or whatnot. Wow. Um, wow. Yeah, it, it is, um, unfortunately, right? Um, you know, I've come to a point that when you start to see Black artists in the blockchain, 
you know, now you're only starting, you, you start, tend to hear some of the same names over, you know, Black artists that you can kind of say, well, if you were to quickly list some of the Black artists that you really know in the space, you could probably name about four or five. And I, you know, I'm probably now I've included there, but I look at so many of my colleagues and say, wow, these are great artists. Why aren't you guys able to sell? Why aren't you selling? How is this person that I feel might be even, you know, as good or better than me? Why is they not selling? But it's a, it's a, it's really a hard market because we, you have to market yourself. That's the other part of this is that you're coming in, um, managing yourself, supporting yourself, is whatnot. Unless you end up with a, a group or a team of people that can kind of help support you, like Black Metaverse joining with certain communities that can help. But I think it's a very low percentage overall in the blockchain of artists. If you go look at our counterparts, I can go and say that I can at least list 50 people, you know, that I see doing it by mine. I can only list a few. Then I go to yeah. these events yeah. and I only see a couple of people that look like me that are in the much higher bracket. And I have to ask myself, why is there only three or four of us out of a hundred people in this large event that mm -hmm. is going to be shown? Yeah. Kwame, I'm glad you said that. Ron, I want to hear you answer, but Kwame, I'm glad you said it because I thought you being on the inside, you might see a lot of us. We have Black Metaverse. We talk about this all the time because there isn't um, a lot of us in the space and we want us to be heavily involved in owning stuff. So I was expecting you to say, well, I'm seeing a bit happen, but if you are on the inside and you see that we're not there, uh, I'm pretty sure I already know what Ron's going to say, uh, but Ron, yeah. go ahead. <laughs> yeah, a lot of it is that it's just a lack of the education yeah. of what it is, you yeah. know? I mean, for me, the, the reason I know about NFT, am I on mute? Can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you. Okay. The reason I know about NFT is because I got into cryptocurrency mm -hmm. early on, like around 20, right, right. 2016, 2017. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and I saw when the crypto kitties and all that stuff I came, I didn't understand what it was, but I was already into crypto and I understood what crypto was. I started, when I first got into it, I didn't know what it was, to be honest with you. I was just buying, somebody said, hey, buy the Litecoin. This is what's hot. So I was just buying. <laughs> then I realized yeah. after a while, there's a reason behind these. Like, what are they doing? What, what's the reason for a, you know, a, 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 a Litecoin or what, what, what does Ethereum do? Why am I invested in Ethereum? Why am I invested in this? And then I realized, okay, in, when I, in order for me to start investing, I need to know what these, what purpose these coins are serving. So I could see the longevity of it, right? Mm, that's right. And, and that was like a learning, that was a learning tool for me. So when the crypto came along, I looked at, I mean, when NFTs came along, I looked at it from that standpoint. Okay. I didn't just, I didn't just look at it, well, oh, this is an NFT, this is a beautiful picture, I'm gonna buy it. You know, I wanted to know the reasoning behind why everybody's buying a lot of this stuff. And then I'm starting to realize most of the stuff is just hype, you know, until they figure it out, what, what, what's gonna make, bring value to an NFT, you know, for you to buy it. Um, then you know it's going to make a lot more sense, and I think a lot of us needs a lot of you know black folks. We need to be educated yeah. to understand what this game is because we, a lot of us don't know. And when we're coming into it, we're just coming into it blindly and, and for the hype, you know. Um, so it's the educational part of it is very important because once we understand it, then we can get into it and start branching off into different sectors. Well, you know, I want to learn more about blockchain or I want to be, I want to take my art and I want to be able to, to flourish in this space. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I want to start my own exchange company or maybe I want to, you know, do something with film. And But it starts with the education. And a lot of us, we just don't know. I, I get a lot of people who tell me, I don't understand this Bitcoin thing. Or I just don't understand this NFT thing, you know? And, and, and to me, I think in, in order to really understand NFT, I think you got to understand crypto. Most of us go straight to NFT and we're lost. You know, if, yeah, well, I can add to that because I came through NFT to learn this. And so the interesting part that I've learned, like, again, chance to, to, to meet you guys was um, 
I didn't know anything about crypto. I mean, I heard of it, but I didn't know anything about it. So, you know, you guys, you, you, you were already in cryptocurrency, you know, and then later on NFT comes, it's like, what's this? Me, I come in from the visual side and just NFTs. Oh, okay. Oh, wow. I learned about Ethereum, Bitcoin, everything from the art side of it. But you're right. It's the lack of education. And even when I would speak to other artists, you know, if I, they only get interested when I show them, I sold an NFT and they see the money behind it. Then it's, oh, I want to be a part. That's it, not, right there. Yeah. Yeah. But they're That's not why thinking, Shay was asking this question <laughs> because that drives people. We can't just see the guy who sold 89 million and did that, but we want to know for real, for real, show me something that is motivational beyond the learning. Show me some Show me some money, you know, that's- And you have to see it from people that look like us because you can go yeah. to people's and anything and they'll just be like, well, yeah, um, of course they, they sell that. But then when you see someone that looks like me and say, well, this is what it did for me, then that's when the interest comes in and that's when the education can, can get in. So how can you educate uh, the whole cryptocurrency um, deal through arts? And then can you- um, can you also teach the NFTs through cryptocurrency? It's interesting that I've had many conversations uh, with, with people that are into cryptocurrency. And then when, when I speak to them and say, they might say, well, what do you think is the problem in, in the black community and NFT artists be successful? And the main thing I say is, well, we don't have, we don't have collectors like the other side do, do you know, if, if you think about it, so much of our art is you know, black art. So, if you don't have, if you have far more black creatives producing content, but not as many of collectors that are into your um, into your theme of it, it makes it even harder. So then you have to figure out how do you expand and get in both in, in, in the genres and reach out to uh, international communities so you can be successful. So now there's you know a lot of when I'm listening to the spaces, there are a lot of artists that are trying to learn and figure this out but again you have to try you know Ron was just saying you you have to understand blockchain you have to understand crypto security when I came in I didn't understand any of that I did the art but guess what I got scammed when I finally hit a certain peak the crypto security part that I did was not aware hit me and I lost <laughs> I lost all my currency I lost oh, no. I would hate that yeah yeah but the, and that quickly told me this is this is the part of the information I lack. I was not in this part of the community that could teach me about safety and cybersecurity and you know um, the cryptocurrency movement stuff around. So I had to learn the hard way. Mm -hmm. And so now I feel now when I speak to people, I feel like if you're gonna do this, you have to get educated in the technical matters, in cryptocurrency matters, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. protect yourself and move forward. And that's what our community struggles with because many just want to bypass and I just want to make art and make money. But it's like, no, no, you, you have to do due diligence. You have to go in and learn. You have to go speak to people like Black Metaverse where you can get that part of the education and then apply it to what you're trying to do. And uh, I think that we continue to do that, we can really become successful. Yeah, I think that's really important. I know Stefan and I, we talk about it all the time is that educational piece and that and that building up the knowledge of those in our community is like one of the number one things that we stress above, you know, all before, you know, before anyone can actually jump into this space and to know what it's all about and how it actually connects to what they're trying to do, their passion in IRL in real life, right? Um, you know, you had touched on like some steps. Um, Kwame, but just want to kind of throw out there, like what steps, uh, what's some additional steps you believe that is necessary for us to take in order to have some global impact here? Like you were talking about small percentages of people, but how can we shift this paradigm to really have some global impact? What are some steps that we can actually put in place here? What are some steps that we can actually put in the atmosphere? Well, I, I, yeah, I, um, a few steps I think that could help with the community being global and getting the understanding would, you know, generally be be involved beyond just art, you know, and I'm trying not to speak only too much to art, but so maybe let me try and make it more broad. But I think being able to um, continue teaching through series of 
this whole matter. And like, for example, we have people in our community that are starting to make documentations, documentations of what they're learning. So what we'll do, and sometimes we'll, you know, we might hop in a room here. Um, there's a new group of uh, black talents that are just getting into the crypto space. And I'll actually be listening to what they're saying. And a lot of them just I'm saying, no, nope, don't do that. <laughs> you know, that's what I'm thinking. Don't go just clicking links. But I think a lot of it will have to do with um, having a central place of documentation. One of the things I always hear coming into the space, people are saying, well, I'm getting in the space, but I don't know where to go. The people that used to hold all these rooms about how to get into this, I don't know how to find them. So we need to find a way. There's there's only a few, I would call, major Black groups in this space that are really providing the knowledge, which is Black Metaverse, African NFT community, uh, Black NFT art and Wakanda. These are four groups that I see in the space yep. that are taking a, putting a lot of work. And I feel like if these groups can even work more so together, that's where we could take it because you guys will handle a lot of the cryptocurrency knowledge that we don't know. And then we're handling the NFT side that we're getting to understand. But this is, but there is a little, a little gap in what I've seen. And I'm always thinking to myself, it's such a powerhouse here. But we have these different groups with such powerhouses with people leading top. At some point, we have to get them all together so that they can reach all of our masses and we can learn specific areas of what you all know, what we know. And I think that's how we'll start to get a lot more global and impactful. I think we lost Lache there. Ron, uh, would you comment on that just a little bit? You, you're already, you have a history of doing stuff globally and you're artists. Um, what do you feel about getting this not off the ground, but uh, tapping into the global economy and the global entertainment and music economy as well? Yeah, I think for us, I think we need to start. I think a lot of us are just focused on the entertainment part. Mm -hmm. I think we need more of us to focus on knowing what the small contracts are, learning about that, because that's, to me, that's the global aspect of it. When you understand small contracts, you can set up certain situations for, for Black artists to do certain things, you know? Maybe have your own, who know, I don't know. Uh, it, it doesn't necessarily. It doesn't necessarily even have to be art. It could just be real estate. It could be. It could be you know a, a, a dealership. Anything just dealing with blockchain that that allows us to be able to utilize something, but it's owned by a black person. Mm -hmm. you know? But everybody globally can use it. I um, it. Yeah, I think we we need to start understanding that aspect of it and start learning about it. You know, and I don't think. Enough of, enough of us are in that space. Everybody wants to be the entertainer. Everybody wants to be the musician. And everybody wants to be the artist, but nobody wants to. But we don't, we don't want to know. I don't know if we, we think it's too hard, but we just need more of that. Because mm -hmm. you know? I want to be in that position where I got my own exchange. And I can say, you know what? This is the Black, men, this is the black uh, Open Sea or something like that. You know, all the Black art come over here, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that can go global. Yeah. Um, you know, you know, things like that. Yeah. I'm sorry. And you know, real quick, it's, 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 and it's, it's definitely important to get certain people with certain knowledge to be known. You know, for example, in, in the Black art community, we're constantly getting scammed because people are getting desperate. They want their shot. And even when I got scammed, I remember thinking to myself, uh, well, I, I need to reach to somebody in cybersecurity, but I wanted to see somebody that looked like me because to, just that level of trust. But now I go in and say, wow, I know a few people that are well known in cybersecurity, but none of them look like me. You know, they might be out there. So that's the thing is like Ron was just saying, where are the where are the people that are willing to be the forefront of that information so you know where to go. I know where to go for certain things in the space, but not for those things, none of them look like us. 
interesting mm. when it comes to issues. Now I got that it. Yeah. 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 And, That's important. Mm -hmm. Like I don't know where I don't know where our cybersecurity person is that we can reach out who can you know do what certain people are doing. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know where you know these the the, the teachers of um, cryptocurrency are. You know I don't I don't know where where these people are. So we're reaching out, listening to other people that don't even really have our best interest. Mm -hmm. So when we're reaching out, you know. They're not even spending that time um, grooming or getting us in a situation that we need to. So we're having to learn extremely the hard way. And I think, if, you know, I agree with Ron and everything he says. I, I hope that at some point that we have those certain people in place that you know who to go to when you need to for the challenges. Being creative is the easy part out of all of this. It just comes from the heart. That's the easy part. The education is the hard part. The protection is the hard part. And, um, and, and yeah, we, we could do a lot more um, to get ourselves out there. Well, Jay-Z Jay -Z and Jack Dorsey, they had, um, they had launched a Bitcoin Academy. Uh, I think it was for Marcy Projects, the projects that he grew up in. <clears throat> but they didn't understand it. They trashed it. <laughs> wait, wait, who is they? Who is they? <laughs> the community. Wow. So, and it sounds like it's so it sounds like when they started this Bitcoin Academy, they probably didn't approach it in a way to be able to get the community to understand it well. And so it goes down, whereas our counterparts do it and everyone's coming in and three months later, oh, we know how to we know how to do it. so. There probably has to be an approach to it too, in a way to tantalize our community enough to let them know, hey, you don't want to be left behind. And but that, that, that's brilliant, though. You were launching the Bitcoin Academy and he bought it to his projects. No? Mm -hmm. That's really wild. And yet it didn't succeed there. Uh, I, I'd be wanting to ask, so why not? And I let's do it. That doesn't mean nobody ever do it again. I would love to know what some of the issues were that young people didn't get it, didn't want to buy in. Was it too complicated? What are the things that we can learn from that? So people are not going to stop. Crypto's here. Bitcoin is here. Bitcoin's not going away. Uh, yeah, we just got to figure out a way for the education to happen. That's what Black Metaverse is all about. So, uh, Lachey, I know you're chomping at the bit with something. <laughs> no, I think I think this has been great. I think the you know, just thinking about the the fact that one, we we have to get, you know, educated, right, about the space so that we can be a part of the space. You know, if, if we're not educated about the space, we can't actually be participatory, we can't be owners in the space. Um, so, you know, it, it definitely starts with education. So education, um, and then um, from the educational piece, you need to make sure that you're not only learning from the books, but you're actually learning by doing. Um, and then from there, you know, taking it to, um, you know, if we're going to really build a global impact, it is looking at how can we collaborate with one another and not being so segmented, you know, all yeah. over the place, right? Um, you know, that those are definitely some of the ways to which we can um, really be global, global minded instead of, you know, in our own like pockets, right? Um, uh, so, and we, we've definitely talked about this, but how can we actually diversify, you know, how can we actually diversify the, you know, the, the space, you know, particularly, you know, with this particular conference, we're talking about, we're talking about music. Yeah. Um, so, so I definitely want us to kind of hone in on that of, you know, how, how can we, uh, you know, as people of color, <laughs> really takes the, you know, take the craft and the expertise in the, the music arena um, and turning, turn it into, uh, you know, building global communities that, you know, are advancing in the emerging technology. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that's something I kind of want to, you know, put that in space, you know, specifically in the realm of music, you know, really yeah. you know, tying together this conversation. That's I think simple people word onboarding. You hear yeah. in this a lot onboarding, just people to take somebody from this step to this next step. Y'all, I do music. I write music. I got stuff with ASCAP and all of this. I learned a little bit about the mint process. All of these are just getting a wallet and creating it. 
if I can take this step of having music, that little wallet in between, make it into an NFT, I get it. It's people that need to see that ease of it, that this is not some big mental thing that you can't get. You make that onboarding simple and accessible. And I think it helps to change the game, you know, and do whatever age you want. I, I'm proof that somebody 60 can do it. Somebody, you get 12 year olds doing this. One of the little, young women that sold, you know, multi-million dollars worth of NFTs was I think maybe 13 when she did it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ron, I think it looks like you're about to say something. And I think you need some people need to know some roles. I mean, if I think that if you're going to educate, people also need to get an idea of where they could be instrumental. Like sometimes I end up hearing people from our community saying, Cur curator, oh, I didn't know about that. Now they want to learn about it. So if you can get them interested in certain segments, kind of like in the real world, you go to school and you're trying to figure out college and you're like, well, I don't know what I want to do, but you get introduced to these certain paths and then you that can fight how you oh, sorry that might be how you get in there so maybe somebody said figures they want to be a curator someone wants to be in crypto security someone wants to be a web rebuilder and maybe starting to show that they can say ah that's how i would learn because maybe someone is just not thinking well i don't have time to learn about i'm not interested in learning about ethereum but you got to put in the bait in there for them yes, to say yeah, this yeah. is why i would want to learn it uh -huh. all right Ron, so so thoughts on that? Thoughts on the piece of you know the music tie-in? I mean that that has been like a major portion, <laughs> you know, of your career in life. You know, if you can, you know, look back. Um, I know I know you give back and everything like that to the community. You know, giving back your knowledge that you know now and infusing it also with you know emerging technology. You know, what are maybe some um, you know, advice, some steps that you would actually, you know, give someone to actually jump into this space who's in the music arena, right? And, you know, who right now is trying to go the old school way of, uh, of, of jumping in. Well, if they're trying to, if they're, they're not trying to go the music industry route and they're trying to get into the NFT space, um, it's a little challenging because one thing about NFTs is if they don't know who you are, they're not going to buy it, right? So it's like, you have to figure out how you're going to promote yourself um, and build a brand. Once you can build that brand and get the promotion, the people will come, you know? And once the people come, then, you know, they'll buy your NFTs. So I think it's important that, um, and, 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 and I think it's, it's doable, you know? You just have to believe in yourself and what you're doing, and you just have to work hard 100% at it, and it'll come. Mm -hmm. Build your fan base, build your platform, and take it 100% all the way. I think sky's, sky's the limit. Um, but you have to really want it. You have to really want it. And I, I think you just hit something on the head, and, and it's, a, it's a huge C word. It's, it's that building community, right? That's like so big in web. Right. Like if you don't have, if you don't have community, you can't build and grow in these spaces. That's mm -hmm. that that is a must. You know, after knowing the knowledge, <laughs> you have to build. You have to build your community of support um, that will surround That's you. Right. Um, you know, while I, we and I think where things are going right now, I think every individual will be their own social media. <laughs> right now, it's a centralized platform of Instagram and Facebook and. They control everything you do. They're controlling your, your, your followers and, you know, they, they spoon feed you. You know, you have 5,000 followers on Facebook and they spoon, spoon feed you like 200 and say, well, if you want to see the rest of the 4,500, you got to pay this amount of money. And, you know what I'm saying? So you don't really get to, to really um, tap into your full audience because Facebook controls it and they want to suck money out of it. So, and they're taking your data and they're doing whatever they want to do with it. So when you become your own social media, where you self-govern everything that you do and everything comes straight to you, then I think it becomes a lot easier because you control the destiny. You don't have to, you don't have to 
be under Instagram anymore. You are, you are your Instagram. You see what I'm saying? And I think once that happens, you build your you build your community, and your platform, and you just do everything all around you without having to rely on any, anybody else. You could be in your mm -hmm. circumference of being in, in the metaverse and just control that platform just from there. Yeah. Even well, this. What? Oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just gonna say, um, you all have your own communities. You got your own networks coming together like this, you know, we have Black Metaverse and this large ecosystem. And then we're on this platform right now, which is part of an ecosystem that's very large, Gatherverse. And uh, Christopher Lafayette is doing a tremendous job at bringing people together. He mainly uses um, LinkedIn, uh, bringing together large communities that sort of sometimes are running parallel to what people are doing. So He's kind of bringing us in these conferences um, for communities to find themselves and then to sort of find a way forward. So you're looking at multiple communities there becoming uh, accessible to one another. So um, yeah, somebody was gonna say something. Yeah, um, Ron had hit it right there when you asked about people coming into the space because as you were uh, speaking about it, I was thinking about how it started for me and you said exactly what I had to do because when I got in space, nobody knew who darkness was, nobody. And number two, when I came into space, black art was just not really getting any push in the space. So, they, and they were talking about um, January to um, April or May when I was in the space. And so yeah, nobody knowing me, I didn't even have a Twitter yet. You know, I didn't have a Twitter and yeah. people said you might need to get on Twitter so you can grow your social. And I actually try to fight it. I no, I will not want to use Twitter. However, I can say that Twitter is where Time found me, Beat Club found me, you know, the gaming, all of them found me. Uh, I did exactly what Ron just said. I came in with a goal that look, I'm gonna have to be my my own marketing, everything. And I learned every part of it. And the drive was so intense and ambitious that now a year and a half later, yeah, my art is international. I'm I'm making this buzz, but it was the importance of coming in and persevering. Uh, I remember because there wasn't a community, I said, Well, if there's not a community, why don't I just try and start one? And it was just ideas mm -hmm. and it happened. And so it's, there is an importance of coming in and really honing in on what you want to do. And, and I, I feel like I'm a living testament of somebody that knew nothing about blockchain, but within about a year, I've been able to uh, become successful with my name and my brand and it's still going. So yeah, Ron, you like hit the nail on the head and it's exactly, exactly what people have to do. They just have to go and believe in themselves and just push through, line yourself up with the right people. That's what's up, man. Congratulations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And if y'all know any artists, what we do, we look for artists. Mm -hmm. Every last one that we can find that has new projects, we say, you can come on this show. We'll help you get your word out. It's what we love to do. And, you know, the, the, the flow of information is pretty significant. So if y'all mm -hmm. know anybody getting into this, has got uh, music, art. We got somebody had a documentary. Uh, and Damon Dash, just, his company just picked up the distribution for yes, a Silk's a, documentary. Yes. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. And he was just on our show. What we wanted is for the world to hear what this young man is doing. So Black Metaverse is just that uh, resource and we'll give uh, exposure to people on a regular basis. Yeah, and so with that, with that stated, we, you know, we, we definitely have this platform today. We would love for you to share um, and tell, you know, everybody, you know, what's upcoming NFT Web3 Met, Metaverse projects. Um, what are you currently working on? What should we be watching out for? And how can we actually support um, both of you? Yeah. Ron? Well, yeah, well, we have, uh, uh, Veta Ridgeway and I, we have a website called culturetech.io mm -hmm. where we give out news on various things that are going on within the metaverse community. Um, everything involving tech, uh, cryptocurrencies, and um, you know, we're just keeping everybody abreast of what's going on within the uh, uh, the crypto and the metaverse and the NFT communities. 
and you know we're doing interviews as well and um just a whole lot of other things and we're planning on also doing a conference a, a music nft conference that's uh what we're planning for the future so you know just look forward to that yeah, so we'll keep our ears ears to the you know ears to the pavement of what's coming down the pikes. So we definitely love to hear more about that um, that music conference, that music NFT conference you have going on. From May, what do you have um, you know currently on the horizon, or what's popping right now that we and everybody globally, because this is out into the world, who can um, support you? Um. Well, it's I'll, I'll, I'll keep it brief because, like I said, for me, the last couple of months have been has just taken off, and I'm actually myself trying to keep up with everything's happening. But uh, I will be a guest speaker at the NFT three awards in um, coming up in the first week of August. Um, I am coming out with a really nice visual project with uh, Timberland Speed Club two, which should be coming out at the beginning of August. And more so, um, more importantly, I'm working on, well, I'm building, continue to build my brand and the work that I'm doing. You guys see this shirt. This is my Africa Made brand. So I do have a site, africomade.com. Can you spell that? I didn't get it. Africa, A-F-R-I-K-O, made, M-A-D-E.com, africomade.com. Okay. And basically it's just, um, digital and physical art that I create, sculpt, and I'm launching, I'm gonna do a full launch by the end of this summer, which will just feature, which will feature a lot of my sculpts and artwork um, that I'm just making available to the community. So it's it's my own little shop that I'm finally gonna be getting um, pushed on. So you will be seeing a lot of new artwork and sculpts uh, and whatnot. And just so everyone knows, Africa Made is basically a brand that I've created, which I call it, you know, the Afro luxury brand. And I, you know, unify uh, my heritage and symbolism and the art that I do, um, creating things, anything from combs to jewelry to shirts and whatnot. And uh, this is my trademark. <laughs> that's great. Well, so if everybody didn't get that, that's first Ron, culturetech.io. And then we had Kwame is africomade.com. Okay, you have the sites, you know the names. <laughs> now you can go and you can support. Because um, one thing, you know, uh, we want to really make sure and do is that, um, you know, people are not only hearing names out there, floating out there, but also knowing what you all actually have going on in these spaces and how can we actually come together and support one another to help once again move towards some, some global impact. Um, Stefan, did you have anything else before we kind of wrap up the conversation? Uh, I think that really covered it <laughs> all. And especially where we're coming from, we talked about that, where we're at right now and where we're going. Yeah, I think, uh, man, this is informative. And so with that, we just thank you. Um, thank you, Ron. Thank you, Kwame, uh, for joining us for the talk today on metafluencing and ownership. Your input has been, you know, invaluable. I know that those that, that are watching and participating in the conference in the Music Meets Metaverse uh, Summit, actually, um, it have uh, taken away some nuggets and we appreciate your time um, today. So thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. Yes, thank you for having us. Thank you for all you all are doing too as well. Absolutely. All right. And with that community, we'll be talking with you all later on the Black Metaverse. All right. Thank you. All right. Bye.